Good morning. Thank you for joining us on this Thursday. Beautiful, um, beautiful morning. Um, I'm Alyssa Yapel, and I'm here today with Heather, who you can't see just yet, but she'll be on the screen in a moment. And she is going to be presenting um, how to hunt for water bugs. So this is our second episode of Ohio's Wild and Scenic Rivers. So if you love exploring and you want to know where to find water bugs and how to make a fun family activity a little bit more educational, you've come to the right place. I think everybody loves getting out and searching in the creeks and streams um, in the hot summer days. So with that being said, um, oh, utilize your Q&A folks. If you have any questions, uh, there is a Q&A box that you can ask Heather or um, Ryan, who's also behind the scenes. He's helping me out today. You can ask them questions. So please utilize the Q&A box or just say hi if you want to. But with that being said, I'm gonna pass it along to Heather. All right, good morning. I am Heather Doherty. I'm the uh, Central Ohio Scenic River Program Manager. We are a part of the Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. And I'm glad you're joining us this morning to talk about creaking for water bugs. This is a great time of year to do it. This is why we were excited to do this webinar because this warm uh, weather is perfect for going out and creaking. So I want to mention this is part two of a four part series. Um, next week we're going to be talking about uh, water bug superpowers. So we're going to go into a little more detail about how they survive underwater. Um, and then in two weeks on August 27th, we're going to be talking about um, why trees are so important to rivers. So in this picture behind me, this is the Olentangy State Scenic River. You can see that the river is surrounded by trees, which is really critical to its health. And lots of fascinating creatures live in this area where water meets land. It has a special name called the riparian zone. So um, on August 27th, we're doing a webinar called Welcome to the Riparian Zone, and we'll explore this really unique habitat. So, um, all right. So if you, I'm gonna, I'm going to share a um, presentation. And if you missed, if you missed last week, um, I'm gonna start with just a little introduction to the Ohio Scenic Rivers Program. Uh, we were created in 1968. So we're the first state in the country to pass a scenic river law. Um, and our it's the, 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 the law and our mission now is to work with local communities to protect Ohio's highest quality rivers for future generations. So these are my children. They are a future generation. I love that they can go play in rivers like this one and it's a safe place to explore and it's full of life and that's part of what we want to preserve for our future generations um, so when we say we're protecting the highest quality rivers you know what does that mean um, to us it means the least amount of pollution and the largest abundance of plants and wildlife um, so today we're going to explore you know if you wanted to measure the quality of a river, how would you do that? Um, well, water bugs is one way that we can measure how healthy our stream is. So we're gonna, we're gonna explore that today. Um, there are only 15 state wild scenic and recreational rivers in Ohio. So again, this is a special designation. Um, community support for designation is a huge part of it. So we're thrilled that these communities wanted to, so, to have their rivers be designated as state scenic. So there's thousands of rivers in Ohio, only 15 of them have this special um, designation. So if you live near one, it's, um, it's something that I think your community can be really proud of. Um, go, visit, go visit one if you haven't yet. All right, so creaking for water bugs. We're going to start off with talking about what is a water bug? So there's a fancy name for it. It is a macro invertebrate. So if you're my daughter, you would think to yourself, what the heck does that mean? It's a big word. So if you break the word down, macro means big. 
it's the opposite of micro. For a micro, if it's something's really tiny, you need a microscope to see it. Um, in this case, we're looking for things that are big and you don't need a microscope. Invertebrate means it has no bones. So we have bones in our body, we have a backbone. Um, invertebrates don't have any. So according to that definition, Olaf is a macroinvertebrate. He's big, he has no bones. Um, okay, what about a crawdad? Is a crawdad a macroinvertebrate? Um, well, does it, is it big? Can you see it without a microscope? Yes. Um, does it have bones? No, it doesn't. Rather than bones, it has an exoskeleton, which is this kind of hard covering around the outside of it. So crawdads or crayfish mean the same thing, um, are macroinvertebrates. And if you're into crawdads, I want to give a plug for a Mohican Crawdad Derby. It's a live virtual event we're doing on Saturday, September 12th. We're going to have a biggest crawdad contest. You can email us photos of entries. Um, catch a crawdad, put it down next to a um, next to a ruler so you can get a measurement. Tell us how big it is. Send me your photos and you will be entered into our crawdad contest. Um, this event will also be posted um, on Facebook on the Ohio DNR page and the Ohio Division of Natural Areas and Preserves page. So. All right, so what else is a water bug? That, what else do we mean by that? Well, we have things like this. This is a scud, it's a crustacean. Um, we have clams, we have snails, we have insect larvae. Um, we're, and a lot of our macros are insect larvae and we're gonna talk more about those later. We also have adult insects. We have worms, just like you would on land. This creature in the center bottom is, uh, it looks a little bit like a leech, but it's actually, um, it's a planaria or a flatworm. And the difference between a leech and this planaria is the planaria has these two little um, spots like on its head. And those aren't eyes. They're kind of um, uh, really simple eyes that detect light. So I think these guys are really cool. They eat leaves that fall into the root. Remember. So these are all different types of macroinvertebrates um, that we look for in rivers. OK, so if you're going to go hunt for water bugs yourself, this is um, some things that will be useful to you. Um, good shoes, water sandals or old tennis shoes are great. Um, closed toe is great because sometimes, you know, you don't want to stub your toe in a big rock. Um, one of the techniques for looking for water bugs is shuffling your feet on the stream bottom. Um, sometimes there's unfortunately um, garbage in the river and you don't want to hurt yourself. So close toe is good. I do not recommend flip flops because they're super slippery. Um, and then if you lose one, they float away. And so we find lots of abandoned flip flops in the river that that um, inadvertently become garbage because people lose them. So um, good shoes are helpful. Um, these are other things that are useful. You don't have to have them, but you know, a bug jar, um, a net if you could, if you have one, but not required. Um, I always try to take a garbage bag with me because there unfortunately is some garbage in the river. So it's a good way to, to pick up a little bit if you're, um, if you see some while you're out there. And of course, a sense of adventure is great for your water bug hunt. All right, so when's a good time to go? Um, August is perfect. You want weather that is warm and the river flow to be low. Um, you want to avoid going when the river looks like this. This is the Big Darby Creek State and National Scenic River when it is flooded. You can see how muddy it is and when it's real muddy that's a good sign that it's rained a lot lately and the the water is up. It's not a good time to go. You also want to avoid cold water. So if you fall in, um, and the river is high, that can be dangerous. So again, fall is really um, the ideal time to go. All right, so um, where to find water bugs? In the river, of course, right? Well, not all parts of the river are created equal. So there's some parts that are better than others. 
So I'm going to show you a few um, images to explain where the best locations are. So I'm going to show you what a one of the habitats in rivers is a pool. So this person is fishing in a pool. The water is deep. It is a um, great place to find fish. The, the river, the water is not moving very fast. It's pretty still. Uh, pools are really great. Not the best place to find water bugs. Um, and one of the reasons is because um, when the water slows down here, if there's any extra mud in the water, it, it will drop out on the bottom. So it'll be kind of a mucky bottom, which is not what our bugs typically want. So the best place to look for water bugs is a riffle. So that's kind of what you can see here behind me. I've heard people call these like little rapids. Um, it's where the water is fast um, and shallow. And you can see behind that the, the there's like ripples on the water surface. So um, one of the reasons this is a good place to find water bugs is because um, just like you and I, bugs um, need oxygen. So we get oxygen from the air we breathe. And there's actually dissolved oxygen in the water. So you can see there's like little bubbles on the surface here. Um, when the river is churned up like this, more dissolved oxygen gets in the water. And that's good for a lot of our bugs really like that. Hey, Heather. Um, yeah. Uh, we uh, have a question from Riley, who is six, and she wants to ask if water striders are considered water bugs, even though they swim on top of the water. Oh, man, that is a really good question. So they're absolutely water bugs. But the kind that we usually look for are kinds that live um, in the water, um, not on top of the water. So those are really considered, um, even though they live on top of the water, because they're not, they don't live down under, they're, they're not the kind of bugs that we usually look for. So there are lots of bugs who live around water, but they're not, like in the water is not their home. So um, we'll talk more about what kind of bugs we look for a little later today but i think water striders are still super interesting critters so but we're looking for here i'll show you another picture that'll help answer this question um we're looking for bugs that live in and under the stream bottom so they live on top of this and they uh, you can see you can see in this photo there's um, gravel and there's cobbles that are a little bigger and sometimes there's boulders and the creatures that we're interested in as water bugs live in and on the stream bottom. So if they live on the surface of the water, um, those are, they're still really cool, but not the types of stuff that we look for when we're talking about macroinvertebrates, aquatic macroinvertebrates. So, um, Again, one of the reasons why the riffle is the best place to find the bugs is because the water is moving really fast. And if there's any mud being carried in the water, um, the fast water uh, pushes all that mud out of the way. So you have this really kind of clean stream bottom. Um, and if you're in a bug, you don't really want to be buried by mud. Um, having this, this spot without all that mud is really important. So. Um, so the riffles are the best place to find your bugs. All right, so you go to a river, you find a riffle. Um, how do you actually find those bugs? Um, one of the ways you can do it is with a net. And so this is me and my daughter. By the way, this is a clip from a video that we made about how to find water bugs. It's only a couple minutes long. Um, and Alyssa is going to share that in the chat so you can kind of see this live and in action if you go to our um, YouTube page. Um, but I have a little net and my daughter Lucy is shuffling her feet in the stream bottom. And we said that these bugs live on and in the stream bottom. So if you kick the stream bottom up with your feet, they will get um, loose and the current will um, push them into the net. 
So if you're using a net, you want to use one that um, doesn't have big holes in it because a lot of the the bugs that we're looking for are really tiny. So a finer mesh net is the way to go. So if you're doing the, if you're using this technique, you want to see the the river get muddy. Like you're kicking it up enough um, that the like you're kicking up some dirt. So this is this is one one way to to find bugs. All right, now I'm going to go back to my slideshow. Okay, so we find bugs in the riffle. We can use a net. Um, you can also just flip a rock over. And you might find things that look like this. So lots of our bugs cling to the bottom of rocks. But why? Like, why would they do that? Why are they not just kind of floating around in the water? Well, if you have fast current, the current's just gonna is gonna wash them away. So they feel like they want to hold on to their habitat. They want to stay put. Um, the other reason they cling to the bottom is they don't want to become fish food. So this is a type of fish that also lives in riffles. Um, there's lots of different species that do. This is a darter. They only get, there's several species of darters. They only get a couple inches long. Um, they also live on the stream bottom. And you can see how, again, they they sit right on the bottom. Um, they have these like fins that help them set up and live in that fast current. Um, th they don't want mud on the stream bottom either. And by the way, excess mud in our rivers is considered our number one source of pollution. Um, it comes from construction sites, it comes from um, farm runoff, and if there's too much mud on the stream bottom, the bugs can't live, neither can these little fish, and it starts to break down the food web, and then there's a, a lot less, a um, lot fewer species living in the river. So anyway, this is a rainbow darter. I think it's super surprising that we have these tropical looking fish in our rivers. Um, they are turn this color when they're spawning. So this is um, in the spring is when you would find rainbow darters that look like this. So they like to eat fish, um, or I'm sorry, they like to eat bugs. Um, and then the bigger fish eat the rainbow darters. So even if you're not into bugs, if you like things like smallmouth bass, um, bald eagles. Um, it all starts with the bugs. If there's no bugs, um, you know, the little bugs eat, feed the little fish, the big fish eat the, the small fish, and then the other animals eat them. So they're a really important part of our food web. So um, they cling, our bugs cling to the bottom, so they don't become fish food. So the species we have here on the left is a stonefly larva. It kind of, it looks like it has two tails. Um, this guy's a mayfly larva. It has three. So these are kind of easily confused. Um, on the bottom here, this thing that looks like a caterpillar is a caddisfly larva. Um, and then this round section cup looking critter is a water penny. So these are all insect larvae. They will all turn into insects that live on land um, when they become adults. Um, so a lot of our uh, macroinvertebrates are insect larvae um, and only live in the river when they're babies or when they're larvae. So this is a picture of their life cycle. So you start off as a nymph or a larva. There's similar. They have to fly off the surface of the water when they emerge as adults after they go through their metamorphosis, kind of like a, um, a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Um, then they fly in the air as grown-ups, then they lay eggs back in the water and they start the cycle all over again. So a lot of people know about mayflies um, if they live in places like Lake Erie because the mayfly larva will hatch out of Lake Erie all at once and they cover every surface. I've never seen that hatch. 
Um, but it sounds pretty crazy to me. The reason supposedly that they do that is because they overwhelm their predators. So can you imagine if you're a fish and you have bugs flying off the surface, this is like a feast for them. So if the mayflies all emerge as adults at the same time, the fish can't possibly eat all of them. Um, these guys are also, um, I think many of them don't eat as adults. They spend most of their life underwater as the larva, as you can see here on the left, um, and only are alive for a day or two um, as adults. Um, they mate, they lay eggs, and then the, the cycle starts over. So if you've ever heard of fly fishing, the mayfly, caddisflies, stoneflies, those are all bugs um, that fly fishers mimic with their lures because those are the types of bugs, because they live in the water at some point in their lives, the fish recognize them and love to eat them. So um, fly fisher men and women um, tie lures that look like these bugs. So these, this is a picture of a mayfly, and those are little mayfly um, lures that have been tied to look like the mayfly. All right, so I'm going to highlight another bug that you can find in the river called a damselfly. So if you have a net, um, use it in this, uh, this plant that grows on the edge of the water called water willow. Um, and you might find a damselfly larva that looks like this. Or it's a nymph. Um, and then they turn into um, bugs that fly in the air that look like this. So if you've ever spent any time um, on the river, you probably have seen these bugs. They also, there's some species that grow and live in ponds instead of rivers. Um, but I think they're, they're really beautiful. The one on the left is called an ebony jewel wing, which is I think the most beautiful name for an insect out there anywhere. And the one on the right is the uh, is called a um, I think it's a ruby, red spot ruby, a damselfly. I'm sorry, I'm not getting that perfectly correct, but anyway, they're really beautiful. They're related to dragonflies, which also spend part of their lives in water, but the damselfly. They say skinny like a matchstick. Dragonflies are fat like crayons. And damselflies also land with their wings closed. Dragonflies land with their wings open. So I think this is one of the coolest, um, some of the coolest wildlife that's easy to observe if you go to a river and you're not even in the water. You can see the adults flying around. Um, these guys are predators. So if you see them, you may notice them sitting on a leaf or a bush next to the river. They sit there, they fly out, they catch a bug, they come back. So dragonflies and damselflies are predators. So they do a good job eating things like mosquitoes. Um, these are good bugs. Okay. Okay, so next week, um, my coworker Ryan is going to talk a lot more about the bugs um, and their superpowers for survival. But right now, I'm going to talk about what bugs tell us about rivers. So if you wanted to know how clean your river was, how could you tell? Um, some people, you know, you would look, sometimes you can just look at it and see, um, does it look bad? Does it smell bad? Does it have a sheen on it that could be pollution? Um, you can look at the water, like the chemicals in the water, and you can do tests for those. Um, but another way you can do it um, is by surveying what lives in the water. So our water bugs are a great tool for that. And we do a lot of that at Scenic Rivers. Um, we monitor for the bugs with volunteers. So you can see here though, the, the woman is holding up a net this is another type of net you can use. You can buy these online. Um, this is called a kick seine. And so the woman wearing the hat is kicking up the river bottom. So she's all the bugs that live um, in the river bottom uh, get dislodged. They get loose when you kick the rocks up and then they flow into the nets. And you take the net to the side um, of the river and you open it up and look at what you found. So 
We call our program for doing this simply Stream Quality Monitoring, or SQM. We've been doing it for almost 40 years, um, thousands and thousands of um, participants. We set up monitoring sites every couple miles on all of our scenic rivers. We have 150 sites statewide that we monitor, um, and our volunteers go out three times a year to look at stream bugs. And you can see here, this young woman is holding a clipboard with this ID sheet. So this is what we give volunteers. And it's, it's the great thing about this is it's pretty simple um, with a little bit of practice. Anybody can learn how to do this. And it's, it's divided up into sections. This top section is, is we call them group one. These are bugs that are sensitive to pollution. That means that if there's pollution in the water, they can't survive there. So on the top tier here, you see the water penny that we talked about, mayflies, stoneflies, um, caddisfly larva, those are all considered sensitive species. Then in group two, we have somewhat sensitive. So um, they don't need as much oxygen in the water. They don't need it to be as clean. So our damsel fly that we were just talking about and our crawdad um, are both in group two. And then we have group three. These guys can live just about anywhere. They tolerate pollution well. So we have some types of snails, um, midge larva, black five larva, leeches are not sensitive um, to pollution. So um, in a healthy stream, you would expect to find a little bit of everything. You'd, you'd want um, lots of different types of bugs from all levels. Um, if you find the bugs that are sensitive, that that is an that is an indicator that your water is clean, and that's why we call these indicator species. Um, if you've ever heard of the canary in the coal mine, it's kind of a similar idea. If you find sensitive bugs, it means that your your water is um, relatively free of pollution. So when we go out and survey rivers, you can assign points. The top level of bugs are worth three, the middle is worth two, the bottom level is worth one, and you count what you find and you can generate a score um, and you can track that over time. Um, if for some reason your score goes down and you stop seeing some of these sensitive species, that means that something's happening and we go out and investigate further to figure out um, if we have some pollution or habitat problems. So um, monitoring is a great tool for teaching science. It's also, uh, I think the best value is um, an opportunity for community to get involved in their river and they become the eyes and ears on the river. And you know they're more likely to see something if there's a problem. So here on the left is our staff teaching people how to do this. We hold workshops, um, usually, you know, over a dozen every year across the state. This year is a little different. We can't hold these workshops, un, un, um, fortunately. But you can still let us know if this is something that you're interested in. Um, and we'll put you in a list and contact you when it is time, um, hopefully next season, to hold workshops and train people again. I've got on the screen here um, the email address of my um, coworker, who is the Stream Quality Monitoring Coordinator in Central Ohio. So you can email her if you're interested. And I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Alyssa to share her email address in the chat because it's really long and easy to mess up. Um, and if she would share mine as well, that would be great. If anybody needs to contact me with questions. Um, All right, so I want to challenge you, anybody who's watching, to go out and find a water bug. So this is my daughter on the left with water pennies on her hand. This critter that um, Sadie is holding in the middle is a helgramite, and they are like the lions of the macroinvertebrate world. They get really big, they eat anything they want. They're, um, they are predators and they eat the other bugs. Um, and of course, this is a crawdad on the right. 
So go out, find a, a water bug, and if you are on social media, you can post it to um, our hashtag scenic creaking. You can also, as a guide, download our kids scenic river activity book. Um, so we just published this recently. It was illustrated by hand by Ryan Moss, our stream quality monitoring coordinator in Northeast Ohio. Um, he did an excellent job. Um, so this is fun just to take along and help you figure out what you found and learn a little bit more about those creatures. Um, there's coloring pages with illustrations of the bugs and then also um, activities to go along with it. Um, and for our educators out there, um, there's lots of great references to food webs and adaptations and metamorphosis. So this is, um, a, the, the, the bugs are just a great teaching tool for lots of our life science. And so up next, next week on Thursday, again at 10 a.m. Um, wait, I got that wrong, I apologize. That's on Wednesday, is that right, Alyssa? Yeah. Uh, she's a force of nature is on Wednesdays, yes. I, and then, yeah. Okay, these are not all on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wednesday, August 19th, She's a Force of Nature uh, is a series that DNR is doing about women with careers at ODNR. And I think this coming Wednesday, do we have someone in law enforcement? Is that correct? Um, Actually, yesterday we had law enforcement okay. and it'll be posted on our YouTube page. But next week um, we have Laura Kearns, a wildlife biologist who oversees monitoring and research of wetland and forest birds of the greatest conservation need. And then Michelle Comer, who you probably know, Heather, um, regional manager um, for West Ohio in the Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. And I'm uh, told that Michelle is no stranger to working in a typically male dominated and physically demanding position. So she's going to shed some light on that. Great. So that is on Wednesday, August 19th and Wednesday, August 26th. I apologize uh, for getting <laughs> that wrong, but we are going to be back next Thursday at 10 o'clock. Ryan is going to talk about water bug superpowers. So go into more detail about all those bugs we talked about today and then um, and how to identify them and how they survive underwater. And then Thursday, August 27th to 10th, we're gonna talk again about why um, trees are so important to rivers. Uh, this is a special area called the riparian zone where water meets land. So that is our, that's our topic for next week. And you can find these um, Facebook events for these webinars um, on the Ohio DNR and the Ohio DNAP page. DNAP, of course, stands for Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. Um, we're also on Instagram at Ohio DNR and Ohio Natural Areas underscore Scenic Rivers. And then um, to wrap it up today, we have a survey that Alyssa is going to post in the chat. So you can tell us how we did and what you liked about it and what else you would like to see us cover. Um, yeah, and Heather, I do want to ask a couple of questions before we wrap yeah. it up. Sure. Um, somebody asked, can someone get a hard copy of the Scenic Rivers Activity Book? Uh, they can. We have a really limited number that we, um, that we printed, but we do have some available. I think we'll print more next year. We didn't print a lot this year because we're not uh, in person with a lot of people. But I think Alyssa, you um, put my email address in the chat. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so you can email me and I'd be happy to get you a hard copy. They are also, so you can, you also can download um, the activity book online um, and, and print it off. Okay. And then somebody asked, do water bugs ever bite humans? Uh, so some of them can, yes. That, um, hold on. I'm gonna go back to a slide. Um, all right, so this guy in the middle, 
Yes, that guy can pinch you. That's a Helgramite. Turns into a Dobson fly. Certainly this guy too, the Crawdad, will pinch you. So you do have to be careful. I don't think you could get seriously injured. Um, you can see here that she's holding this Helgramite flat on her hand. And so I've handled them a lot that way. And if you're not, you know, trying to grab them in the middle, um, typically it'll just crawl on you and they won't, they won't pinch you. Um, but then there's plenty of water bugs like the water penny that will cause you absolutely no harm. So um, we typically handle these guys um, with no problem, but these guys that have pinchers, you do, I think you do want to be cautious. Um, there is, there are ways to handle them um, without getting pinched. Um, if you come to, uh, we actually put both of these guys um, in a normal year, we would be at the Ohio State Fair where ODNR has a tremendous um, uh, park where you can explore a lot of what DNR has to offer. We have a water, uh, a water table where we stock um, macroinvertebrates and we let people handle these creatures and we do so safely. So next year, go to the state park um, or go to the state fair and come see us in the back corner and we'll we'll show you how to do it without getting pinched. Um, but in general, it's not something, getting pinched is not something that I worry about too much if I'm out looking for bugs. Um, well, I think that you covered it all, Heather. I think <laughs> I think that um, and you covered the webinars for next week. So yeah, um, yeah, we are good to go. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, and I, I'll give a special shout out to Lake Lewis and uh, his brother and sister who um, were very active today during the webinar and they join us almost every week. So thank you. Um, and we will see you all next week. Bye. All right.